Coming up on Locked On Dodgers, the Dodgers beat the Cubs 5-3 to three to start this four-game series in their last series of their last homestand before the All-Star break. We're going to talk about the uh, powerful offense that led them to that victory, along with some mostly really good pitching. And we're going to spend some time talking about legendary scout Mike Brito, who passed away on Thursday. So let's get Locked On Dodgers. You are Locked On Dodgers. Your daily Los Angeles Dodgers podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network. Your team every day. Hello, Dodger fans. This is Locked On Dodgers. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network. Your team every day. Thank you for making Locked On Dodgers your first listen every weekday morning. Remember, this show is free and available on all podcast platforms and on YouTube simply by searching for Locked On Dodgers. Or even better, go ahead and subscribe wherever you're watching or listening right now, and then you'll never miss a day because you know we're not going to. If this is your first time listening or watching, my name is Jeff Snyder. My co-host is Vince Samperio, but it's just me today. Vince and I are both lifelong Dodger fans, just like you are. We've also both spent time covering the Dodgers in the press box on the locker room. So we're not quite insiders, but we bring you the smart fans perspective on our boys in blue every weekday morning. And hey, Dodger fans, you're going to love this. Today's episode is brought to you by the Sports Card Investor app. Welcome to the world of trading cards reimagined. Stay tuned later in the show for more information on this awesome new tool for collectors. You're going to want to check out the Sports Card Investor app. So as I mentioned at the top, the Dodgers beat the Cubs 5-3. to three. It was uh, mostly a really good game. Uh, Dodgers only had seven hits. Luckily, four of them went over the fence. Uh, two home runs from Mookie Betts, two solo homers, a two-run homer from Gavin Lux, and a solo homer from Justin Turner that looked about like an instant replay of, or not quite instant, a five years later replay of his walk-off homer against the Cubs in the 2017 NLCS. Only difference is my buddy Keith Hupp was not out there in center field to catch this one like he was in 2017. This one went to much less... Uh, skilled home run catchers let's put it that way uh somebody ended up with the ball but it sure wasn't caught on the fly i texted keith he was uh not thrilled about the performance put on in center field uh in the bleachers but you know i was thrilled about the home run i was happy about that tony gonsolin had another great outing i'm going to talk more about the pitching in the second segment of this game but i want to talk a little bit about the offense uh because it was a little bit different game that like i said the dodger only had the seven hits uh trey turner had a double uh let's see who else had hits for them i know that trey turner and freddie freeman and will smith so smith had a line drive single but basically the two through six hitters trey turner freddie freeman will smith and max muncie went two for 16. dodgers didn't have any walks which is kind of outside the norm for them uh the only other non-homer hit uh came from trace thompson so other than that it was just kind of a like offensively it wasn't a great game but it showed if you hit enough home runs, it doesn't have to be a super great game overall. Uh, Mookie hit the leadoff home run, got the Dodgers out on the board, uh, and then Gavin Lux's home run was a thing of beauty. You could actually kind of see him peeking towards right field. And I don't know if it was peeking to think I'm going to turn on one. Uh, Joe and Oral had just been talking about the fact that Gavin Lux – hasn't really turned on a lot of balls, hasn't really had that home run power much this year. I think this is only Lux's third home run of the season. Uh, and right after they were talking about that, he turned on this one and he destroyed it. And it showed, I mean, Gavin Lux has a ton of power when he wants to, but he is, that's not necessarily his his game this year. Uh, I do hope that uh, what we'll see is that he will, kind of like what we talked about with Cody Bellinger on yesterday's episode of, seeking out those spots where you can search for a fastball, hunt a fastball that you can drive and and go with it that way uh, and, and kind of s- hunt those home runs once in a while. Obviously, Bellinger has more raw power than, than Lux does, but Lux is a, a big, strong man and uh, can do that too and maybe has the hitting part down a little bit better than Bellinger right now. And so I like the idea of him hunting those those fastballs looking for a home run when he's in a favorable count, knowing that he can still, you know, Lux has shown he can hit with two strikes this year. So I like that approach. It was really good to see Mookie hit two home runs, especially because the second one came after he had been hit on the hand by a pitch. 
which is always scary. It's only 88 mile, mile an hour fastball, but that's still fast. That still hurts. And I got him right on the back of the hand. I wish he had been able to get his, his left elbow up and use that elbow guard a little bit instead. But it got him on the hand. Trainer came out and looked at him, and he stayed in the game and later hit another home run. Seemed all smiles throughout the game. Uh, other than one play in the ninth inning, uh, in the top of the ninth, a little bloop double that, that Kimbrell gave up that we'll talk more about in the second segment. Mookie had maybe had a chance to catch it and went to dive and then changed his mind, it looked like. So he kind of slid and knocked it down uh, instead of catching it. I don't know if he could have caught it, but you can tell he's still a little bit ginger about the rib. Um, and, and so, you know, it, it's an interesting version of Mookie Betts we have right now because you can tell he's not quite 100% recovered from that that broken rib, and yet he's got – he had two home runs tonight, uh, three home runs in the last few days. He's at 20 for the season now. Just uh, – I mean, Mookie Betts is a really good baseball player. That's – you know, obvious statement of the day, I know, but uh, it, it was good. And then to see Justin Turner hit, hit a home run, continue his hot streak, uh, it's it's crazy how bad Justin Turner looked for the first couple months of the season and how good he's looked lately. Hopefully this is the real deal. Uh, there's no reason to think it's not. Um, obviously he won't stay this hot, but uh, hopefully this uh, can carry over for the rest of the season into the postseason of being a good, solid contributor to the middle middle of the Dodgers lineup. Because that's what they need from him. He was one for one for three today. Uh, yeah, overall, nobody had more than one hit except for Mookie's two homers, and just a balanced, not overwhelming, but powerful offensive performance. And when you have Tony Gonsolin on the mound, sometimes that's all you may, all you need is balance and a little bit of power. And so the Dodgers did did have Tony Gonsolin on the mound, and that worked out as well as it has every other time he started this year, which is. Very well. So I'm going to come back in a minute. I'm going to talk about Gonsolin's game. I'm going to talk about the bullpen. A uh, little bit of the Dodgers had to use a couple more pitchers than they maybe thought they would. One because of potential injury and one because of ineffectiveness. So we're going to talk all about the bullpen and Tony Gonsolin and all that in the next segment. So thank you for making Locked On Dodgers your first listen every day. And please keep it Locked On Dodgers. Hey. Uh, I want to talk to you about the sports card investor app. It's basically, it's an app where, you know, whether you are a casual baseball card collector or you're looking to actually, you know, have alternative investment opportunities, the free sports card investor app has something for you. As I've mentioned before, I've got a ton of baseball cards. Like I am surrounded by baseball cards right now. You guys can't really see it, but I'm surrounded by baseball cards. I'm just going to grab a pile and let's see. If there's, I almost knocked over my Max Muncy bobblehead. See if there's anything that uh, might be interesting on the sports card collector app. Oh, I grabbed my pile of Alec Bohm cards. That's a sports card collector app can tell you that Alec Bohm, not quite as in demand as he was, you know, last season maybe or the year before that. You know who might be though? Key Brian Hayes. Rookie card there for Key Brian Hayes or a future stars card. Uh, I love that dude. Best third baseman in baseball uh the best defense at their baseman in baseball i should say got some juan soto cards here that's always exciting juan soto you know whatever you got going on uh if you're looking you're wondering okay what's the demand for these shohei otani is having another great year i've got a shohei otani rookie card what's the demand for that check out the sports card investor app because literally you can find out they have recent sales you can say okay how much of these sold for in the last week how much in the last month is it going up is it going down everything you need if you're trying to turn your your baseball cards into an investment and make some money on them, the free Sports Card Investor app is going to be useful for you. So download the Sports Card Investor app today. It's available for free in the Google Play and Apple App Stores or go to sportscardinvestor.com slash locked on. All right, I am back. And uh, I mentioned the offense in the first segment. Maybe the story of this game was the pitching uh, because I, I don't know. When you score five runs, with the way the Dodgers pitching has been, you're most likely going to win the game. And when you allow only two runs or three runs in a game and the way the Dodgers offense have been, most likely you're going to win. So it was really a, a tag team effort. Tony Gonsolin pitched seven innings, allowed just two runs, just one two run homer to Christopher Morrell. Uh, wasn't a bad pitch. Wasn't a terrible pitch. It, it was a, a good splitter. And Gonsolin after the game said, you know, you tip your cap there. He, he hit my best pitch. And, uh, you know, he, we did see Morrell swing through a few high fastballs uh, in this game. And so 
hindsight 2020, maybe see a go high fastball there, but he had also just gotten two swings and misses on high fastballs. And so it's hard to get away with that a third time. So, you know, it, it's easy to second guess, but Gonsal made a good pitch and Morel hit it out. And Morel is a, a very good young player. Uh, he, if you have Morel, Christopher Morel cards, check out the Sports Card Investor app for that because uh, they they might be going up in value because he's been doing pretty well. And that was all that Gonsolin gave up. He Overall, he allowed just uh, four hits, no walks, only struck out three. That's kind of classic Tony Gonsolin. Sometimes he'll have a game with a big strikeout number, but three strikeouts in seven innings, but a lot of weak contact. Other than that home run, it was mostly, it was mostly weak. Uh, and got through seven innings efficiently, through 90 something pitches uh, and turn it over to the bullpen and going seven innings, you expect, okay, this will be two relievers, uh, a bridge to Craig Kimbrell and then Kimbrell. Unfortunately, uh, Bruce Gratterall came in through four pitches and then called for the trainer. And he said he had a cramp in his side. I'm trying to remember which side it was his right side. Um, he said it was a cramp. We we actually saw Max Muncy turn away from the conversation with the trainer and just kind of mutter the word cramp. Uh, we saw that on the camera. The, the concern is, I don't know that in the moment you can tell the difference between a cramp and a, a strain. And it was right there near his oblique. And oblique strains can take forever, uh, especially in baseball. There's so much torque, so much oblique work, whether you're a hitter or a pitcher, there's so much torque involved that uh, it's scary. I'm a little bit nervous that Bruce Dar might miss a month or so. Uh, if it's his oblique, it could be, you know, that long. It could be a cramp. It could be that he wakes up tomorrow feeling great and they, you know, they give him tomorrow off and, you know, kind of do a bullpen session. Everything feels good. And, and we never think about this again. That's a possibility. It could have been a cramp, uh, but, you know, maybe it's worst case scenario. You always think eh, that looks like an oblique and that's bad news. Uh, that happened with Morell at the plate, a two on one count. And Phil Bickford was kind of forced into action or as Oral Hershiser said in a way that made my son laugh, thrust into duty, um, grow up. Uh, Phil Bickford came in and he struck out Morell and then he uh, got Andrelton Simmons out and got out of the inning. But, you know, it was kind of, probably weren't planning on using Bickford in this game. You think, okay, Gratter on the eighth, Kimbrough on the ninth. So you had to use Bickford. And then in the ninth inning, uh, Kimbrough comes in, strikes out the first two batters. Great. Things are looking good. Uh, and then gives up a bloop single to Ian Happ and a bloop double to Seiya Suzuki. The single to Happ, Cody Bellinger. I don't know. This is two games in a row that I felt like there was a ball that there have been some versions of Cody Bellinger that we've seen that would have caught it. Uh, and, and he didn't catch either of them. And I don't know, like I've mentioned in the past, it, as much as Bellinger still looks very, very good in the outfield, his actual defensive numbers aren't great this year. And I wonder if it's because there are certain balls like these ones coming in into, to, to his right, that he just doesn't have, whether he's getting worse jumps or, uh, isn't reading them well. I don't know what it is, but, uh, Maybe he's not getting quite as many of those. Uh, I feel like there are times in 2019 when Bellinger was the best hitter in baseball and the best defensive outfielder in baseball, I feel like Cody Bellinger catches that hat ball. And uh, if he does, that's a perfect three three batter save for Craig, Craig Kimbrell. Everybody's happy and thinking, sweet, Kimbrell's back. He didn't catch it. And then there's the bloop double by Seiya Suzuki that if Mookie Betts doesn't have the broken rib he's dealing with, Maybe he gets to that one, dives that lays out and catches that. And uh, Kimbrell has a nice four outs or four batter save and no harm done, no runs allowed. And, you know, but both of those balls did barely fall in, which is kind of a continuing theme with Craig Kimbrell. His Babbitt allowed coming into this season for his career was 263, which if you're not familiar with Babbitt, that is batting average on balls in play. So any fair ball, that isn't a home run is a ball in play, basically. Ground ball, fly ball, whatever. If it if it goes in a fair territory and it doesn't go over the fence, it's a ball in play. Most of the time, uh, your average pitcher will have about a 290 to 300 BABIP, meaning 29 to 30% of the time that they allow a fair ball that's not a home run, it will turn into a hit. Uh, Craig Kimbrough, first career, 263. 26% of the time, uh, 
though a ball in play will turn into a hit against Craig Kimbrell. This year, it's over 400, more than 40% of the time. I don't know the exact number. I know it was 397 coming into this game, and then balls in play were two for two in this game, so that probably bumped it up a little bit over 400. More than 40% of the time that Craig Kimbrell allows a ball in play, it's dropping in for a hit. That is the definition of bad luck. There's no reason, there's no rhyme or reason, nothing to explain it other than bad luck. Things are falling in. You know, if, if Ian Happ hits the ball one mile an hour harder, Cody Bellinger catches it. Uh, if he hits it three miles an hour softer, you know, it probably gets caught by the shortstop. It just, it was just a ball that falls in. You know, those happen sometimes. Suzuki's, if he hits it a little bit harder, it's caught. Uh, or if he hits it a little bit further to the right, it's a foul ball. It was just a little fluke hit. Uh, and fluke hits happen. That's the nature of BABIP. That's the whole point of BABIP is that once the ball is in play, the pitcher doesn't have any control. The purpose of BABIP is, BABIP is to focus on things that a pitcher, it explains the things a pitcher can't control. The theory is you can control whether you let them hit it hard enough to go over the fence. You control strikeouts. You can control walks. Once the ball is in play, you're at the mercy of your defense. You're at the mercy of luck. All those things. And so Craig Kimbrell's BABIP being over 400 this year is bad luck. I'm not going to say Craig Kimbrell's been great, but in this game, he had bad luck and he couldn't throw his curveball for a strike. Out of 31 pitches, he only threw the curveball six times. Only one of them was a strike, and that was a ball that, that Ian Happ swung at that wasn't in the strike zone. Craig Kimbrell did not throw a curveball in the strike zone and wasn't getting many chases. It's kind of funny. The one that Ian Happ did swing at, the umpire called it a foul tip. Happ missed it by a foot. I don't know what the umpire saw. But uh, so officially it goes down the record books as a foul tip. It was a swing and miss. Uh, but they they mean the same thing anyway. Uh, but that that's just a side note. But yeah, his curveball wasn't landing, so he was only throwing his fastball. And so he has the big, long 10 pitch at bat against Patrick Wisdom where, yeah, if Kimbrell had been able to land his curveball, he probably gets a strikeout on Wisdom or a ground out and the game's over and he gets to save. But he couldn't throw it for a strike. But that's not actually been the common theme with Kimbrell this year. And, and I'm not sitting here making excuses for Kimbrell. I'm explaining what's happening. Uh, and yeah, I definitely wish that he would have more clean outings. Uh, but most of the time this year, when he's had command issues, it's actually been the fastball. He can't land the fastball for a strike to set up the curveball. And, and so it hasn't been the curveball. But in, in tonight's game, it was that he couldn't throw the curveball for a strike. So he... The fastball was the only pitch he could trust, and that just, you know, between some hitters are just going to hit fastballs. You're not going to get a strikeout on their fastball, just fastballs, and I think he ran out of gas a little bit. He he pitched in the previous game, only five pitches, but when you count warm-ups and everything, you know, it's, it's a real appearance, and then throwing a career or a season-high number of pitches in this game, I his fastball was losing velocity by the end. Uh, he ended up walking wisdom, and they had to bring in Alex Vesia to get the save. And so a second pitcher who they didn't plan on using, they thought they would go Gonsolin and then two relievers. Instead, they went Gonsolin and four relievers. Uh, Bickford only had to face two batters. Vesey only had to face one. Hopefully that, you know, it won't mess up their bullpen bullpen plans too much. But with with a potential injury to Gratterall and having to use extra pitchers, that's a, it's a little concerning. So I wouldn't be surprised uh, if they, you know, I don't know. They may have to bring in some reinforcements uh Hopefully, you know, Tyler Anderson can can do, go deep in a game. Clayton Kershaw can go deep in a game, and they can give the bullpen a little bit of a rest leading into Monday's day off. But I don't know. I feel like I've turned into a Craig Kimbrell apologist, and I don't intend it to be. I'm not trying to be contrary. I just look at what ha what is happening, and Kimbrell still has very good stuff, and it's very clear that he has been unlucky. Uh, doesn't mean that he will that his luck will turn around. There's no guarantee of that. Maybe he will continue to be unlucky. But the thing about luck is most of the time it's not predictable. And most of the time you, you know, revert back to norm. And so Craig Kimbrell, I would expect him starting right now till the end of the year to have a BABIP somewhere in his normal range, you know, 260 to 280, somewhere in there. If he does that, he is going to be a dominant reliever because that will mean his luck has evened out. 
you know, in a perfect world, in my perfect world, his Babbitt for the rest of the season would be 180 to make up for the 400 that he's had so far. And that would make him like the best closer in the history of the world. Uh, that's not going to happen. But if he can go back to regular Craig Kimbrell, he's going to be successful. And my last point on Kimbrell is something I've said before. The Dodgers don't have the built-in loyalty to Kimbrell that they had to, to Kenley. And so if Kimbrell doesn't get this turned out, turned around before the postseason, he won't be the closer in the postseason. So I, I've seen people on social media tonight worried, you know, oh, I can already see Kimbrell blowing games in the postseason. It's not going to happen. If Kimbrell hasn't got, has gotten his luck turned around and gotten things figured, it doesn't mean he won't blow a save in the postseason. But the version of Kimbrell we've seen so far this year, if he's still pitching like this with this bad luck, he won't be the closer in October. That's the that's the bottom line. So that's going to do it for that conversation. All in all, the Dodgers won the game. It's a it's a good start to the homestand. They've now I think they're eight games into this homestand and they're seven and one. The Giants beat the uh, uh, no the Padres beat the Giants in, in extra innings, and so Dodgers don't gain ground on the Padres. They're still six games ahead of them. They do gain another game on the Giants, so they're eleven and a half games ahead of the Giants. Giants are only one game over 500 at this point, so uh, they are quickly falling out of contention. Uh, they are closer to last place by quite a bit than they are to first place. Uh, they're uh, almost as close. They're six games out of last place. They're only five and a half games out of second place, so they're almost as close to last place as they are to second place. So, uh, But the Padres, you know, that both those teams are still good teams. They're going to stick around, so we're going to keep watching their results. So I'm going to come back in a minute. I'm going to talk about Mike Brito who uh, passed away on Thursday at the age of 87, just a, a legend in baseball, a legend in Dodger baseball. So thank you for making Locked on Dodger first listen, and please keep it Locked on Dodgers. Let's talk about Built Bar, but more specifically, let's talk about Coconut Brownie Chunk Built Puffs. You've maybe had the Coconut Brownie Chunk Built Bar. Well, they've pumped all that same flavor into the puff and a Built Puff, if you ever had one, it's basically like a chocolate-covered marshmallow full of protein. It's all low-calorie, low-sugar, high-protein, all delicious. These things are so good. I really, really like the puffs, and I can't wait to try these Coconut Brownie Chunk Puffs because the Coconut Brownie Chunk Built Bar is one of my favorites. I don't even like coconut, but I love that Coconut Brownie Chunk Built Bar, so I can't wait to try the puff. Uh, if if that sounds good to you, you should go buy some. If, if you haven't tried Built Bar, Get yourself a mix box. They'll send you some built bars of different flavors. They'll send you some puffs of different flavors. You can try it all. Find out what you like because, I mean, if you're looking for a healthy snack that is good for you and delicious, you can't go wrong with a built bar. There's nothing better. So, whatever you decide to buy, go to built.com and use promo code LOCKED15 and you will get 15% off your order. That's promo code LOCKED15 for 15% off at built.com. All right, folks, I am back for one last segment. I just want to spend a little time talking about Mike Brito. Uh, you may know the name, you may not. Uh, if you are anywhere near my age uh, and you grew up watching the Dodgers, you know Mike Brito when you see him. He is the guy, before they renovated Dodger Stadium, uh, the, the area that's now the dugout club used to not be there. That was all foul territory. And behind the plate in the back of where what's now the dugout club, it was like some little dugout seats. Like literally they were a couple feet underground. So the people sitting there were looking out through glass or a screen or whatever. And they were a, a couple feet below the ground. So their eyes were, their head was about, you know, a couple feet above the ground basically. And Mike Brito was always standing back there in his Panama hat, sometimes with a cigar in his mouth and he always had his radar gun and he was taking his radar readings. And, you know, when I was a kid with, with the hat and and the gun, he, he reminded us of kind of a, a gangster kind of look. So we used to call him Al Capone. Didn't know his name. We just called him Al Capone, the Dodgers Al Capone. Uh, and later we learned that he was the scout who had signed Fernando Valenzuela among other people later in his, his, in his time as a scout, he signed Yasiel Puig, and Julio Urias and Victor Gonzalez all on the same trip to Mexico. Uh, it, and those are 30 years apart, 35 years apart. And, and those, uh, oh, all in all, I think Mike Brito signed 32 players who made it to the big leagues in 43 years as a scout. That's really, really good. International scouting is not that easy. Uh, and he had a, 
a life in baseball. He played, he grew up in Cuba, played baseball in Cuba. And uh, this was before the, the Castro regime. So people could actually leave Cuba to come try to play in the big leagues. And he signed with the Washington senators, the same scout who signed uh, some legends like Tony Oliva and Camilo Pasquale and Zoilo Versailles, uh, guys who were big contributors for the senators. And then senators became the Minnesota twins in the sixties. Uh, the same scout who signed those guys also signed Mike Brito uh, to the to the Washington Senators, and uh, Brito joked later that uh, this guy was a really good scout, but he made a mistake signing me. Uh, Brito never made it as a ball player; he was a catcher, had some power, but never got to the big leagues. And then he went to Mexico to play in the Mexican League for a few years, and that was his first his inter- introduction to the country of Mexico that he ended up being becoming a legend in. Played for a few years in Mexico and then uh, moved to L.A. and was driving a truck and playing in an adult baseball league that he started. And he went up against a guy named Bobby Castillo who threw this screwball and struck him out. And Bobby Castillo, uh, he was he, he was friends with Al Campanis, who was the Dodgers GM at the time. And... Uh, he any, anyway ended up helping the Dodgers sign Bobby Castillo. Bobby Castillo later taught that screwball to Fernando Valenzuela. Castillo played for the Dodgers two different stints in the 70s and 80s. Fernando obviously used that screwball to become one of the best pitchers in baseball for several years. Uh, and just over the years, that, that started this relationship between Brito and the Dodgers. Uh, Brito actually didn't report to the head of scouting. He reported directly to Al Campanas. Campanas referred to him as his personal scout. Uh, and he, he spent the next four plus decades scouting for the Dodgers, even up until like last year, there, there's a, a funny quote from, uh, from Jaime Harin who, uh, you know, Jaime Harin was a Dodger Spanish language broadcaster forever and, uh, just retired. And Harin said he asked Brito when he was going to retire and Brito said, uh, I'm trying to find the quote really quick. Sorry. Um, but, but yeah, Brito basically said, I'm going to work until the day I die. And basically he did. He, that day came, he's 87 years old, lived a long and fulfilling life, uh, with, with his family and his, his, uh, reputation in baseball is unparalleled. Mike Brito, we may end up seeing him honored in the hall of fame at some point. Scouts haven't traditionally been get, haven't gotten their due maybe uh and so uh but mike brito if any scout is going to make the hall of fame it's it's going to be mike brito he's been very very good and he's a fixture at dodger stadium it's going to be it's sad you could still see him around wearing all his world series rings he was so proud to be a dodger everybody who ever met him loved him and uh i was not one of the people who ever met him but i feel like i know him because i saw him so much growing up watching Dodger games, being around Dodger Stadium. So our thoughts and prayers go out to his family, his wife Rosario, everybody who cared about him. It's a it's a hard time for them, uh, but he lived a great life and contributed greatly to the team that we love. So rest in peace, Mike Brito. And that's going to do it for me today. Thank you for making Locked On Dodgers your first listen every weekday morning. Now for your second listen, check out Locked On MLB Prospects. Host Lindsey Crosby is a prospect encyclopedia, and he's going deep on the MLB stars of tomorrow. It's free and available wherever you get podcasts. Uh, If you aren't watching or listening to Locked on Dodgers every day, we would love if you would add, you know, one or two days a month to your rotation. If you have friends or family who love the Dodgers as much as you do, please tell them about the show. Maybe they'll like it too. You can follow us on Instagram and on Twitter at Locked on Dodgers. Vince is on Twitter at Vince Samperio. I am on Twitter at Snydog, and the DMs are open in all of those places. You can also email us anytime you want. Our email address is LockedOnDodgers at gmail.com, or you can leave a voicemail or shoot us a text at 323-863-LOCK-5625. We are here every weekday morning, and we hope you'll be here with us. When you get in your car or sit on your couch, tell your smart device to play podcast Locked On Dodgers. And remember, you don't have to agree. You just have to listen. We'll talk to you on Monday.